Welcome. You're listening to Nigel Thomas, parish priest to two villages in rural North Somerset. And I'm recording this podcast in the season of Lent 2021, whilst the nation is still in lockdown because of the COVID pandemic. Lent is that season in the church year set aside for reflection and amendment of life. It's traditionally kept as a penitential season. It begins with Ash Wednesday when we recall, we are but dust and to dust we shall return. And in the following 40 days, we hear again stories of Jesus' ministry in the towns and villages around Galilee, the miracles, the parables, the teaching. And we follow him to Jerusalem with the triumphal entry into that city, the crowds waving palm branches and crying Hosanna. Then only days later for those same crowds to cry, crucify him. On Good Friday, we follow again the passion story, which takes us to the cross, Jesus' crucifixion, his death and burial. And all this in preparation for the greatest of Christian festivals, Easter, with its message of resurrection and new life. This would be a traditional observance of Lent. Indeed, it would have been our uh, pattern for an observance of Lent this year, but for these most challenging of times. And it is because of these times and because of lockdown, when we are not allowed to travel, not allowed to meet others, that I wanted to ask the question, what is there within the Christian tradition that might help us make an inward journey, something that would enable us to keep a good Lent and give us strength and resilience, courage to face whatever lies ahead. Religious communities, monastic communities have from the very, very earliest years of the Christian faith and practice been examples of how to live simply and prayerfully in community and in isolation. In seeking to answer the question, what might help us live through these times, my interest has been drawn to these communities and what they might teach us. Now I am a member of a religious order, the Franciscans, and as a, a tertiary within the third order of St Francis, I seek to follow the principles laid down by Francis, our spiritual father. And whilst there is much about the Franciscan life and spirituality that is so very relevant for our times, it is actually to another order, a sister order, to which I have been drawn, uh, an order that predates Francis, that of the Benedictines. Benedict of Nursia in Italy lived in the 6th century and is rightly regarded as the father of Western monasticism. In his lifetime, he founded monasteries throughout northern Italy and it is his rule for living the religious life written for those communities which was adopted by religious throughout Europe. And today there are still Benedictine communities uh, continuing to draw people in. Benedict's influence here in the British Isles can be seen not only in the historical monasteries that have sprung up over the centuries, but also in the pattern for daily prayer. The offices um, said seven times during the day in those monastic communities and the whole of the Psalter, the whole uh, 150 Psalms uh, chanted in, during one week, each week, regularly, faithfully. Um, it can be seen that pattern of prayer um, in a simplified form um, adapted by the Church of England into the office, the daily office, morning and evening prayer. And most recently, Benedict's rule of life and pattern uh, for daily prayer has been picked up, adopted 
by groups within the new monastic movement and the emerging church. And so in this season of Lent, it's timely in lockdown to look afresh at Benedict's rule of life. What is Benedict's Rule? Well, it's a practical set of guidelines for living a life of moderation and stability within the religious community. It is his own reworking of the pattern for Christian living, followed by the Desert Fathers of the 3rd and 4th century, particularly that of John Cassian and Saint Anthony of Egypt. The genius of Benedict's rule is that he adapts the harsh privations of desert-dwelling monks to fit his European world in a practical and compassionate way. His rule is based on a daily rhythm of prayer, devotional study and manual work. Those following the rule would be expected to shape their daily lives according to that rhythm. It strikes me that this is the right time to rediscover Benedict and his rule with so much uncertainty and change that is challenging us for those seeking a rhythm to their daily life, a means to live a simpler, more prayerful life the rule is supremely adaptable. It must be to have stood the test of time. So to return to the question, what can Benedict's rule teach us for our time now? <laughs> I began this podcast asking the question, what can the rule of St. Benedict teach us in nurturing our inner life, in being aware and awake to God's presence in the world and in us, and in cultivating a spirituality for our time? Esther Duval, well-known author on the subject of prayer and spirituality, writing for, from her own lived experience, says, I have come to see the rule of St. Benedict like a tapestry. I think that's a really good description, that mix of threads that makes up the whole. There are some slightly darker threads in the rule. The language of corporal punishment for rebellious monks sounds very strange to our modern ears. However, there are much lighter threads and I want to pull out five threads from that tapestry and give them to you in the hope that you might take them and plait them together into a prayer rope to help you through lockdown, through Lent and into whatever comes after. In the prologue to his rule, Benedict begins, Listen carefully, my son, for the master's instructions and attend to them with the ear of your heart. This is advice from a father who loves you. 
welcome it and faithfully put it into practice. This really sets the tone for all that will follow. The call to set aside self, to set aside ego, to still ourselves, to be attentive to God and to listen, to listen deep within with the ear of the heart. Listen for that still, small voice. Benedict wants to teach us how to pray. So much of prayer, it seems, is us talking, us speaking to God, telling him how great he is, how rubbish we are, and asking him in the form of long lists sometimes to put right all the wrong things that we can see and sometimes experience in the world. Whilst this kind of prayer has its place, the offering of thanks and praise, as in the Psalms, asking God to act on another's behalf, honouring a prayer request. Benedict is speaking of prayer as attentive listening. It might help us here to think of the qualities a person has who we would describe as a good listener, someone who knows how to be still, quiet, relaxed, someone who is stable, grounded, someone who is focused on the other, who is paying full attention, someone who is completely in the moment, fully present, not trying to butt in with their own words or concerns. Good listening, prayerful listening, holy listening comes when it is practised. The key is learning to be still, making that choice to stop, to make space in the day to still ourselves, sit quietly, sit silently, and give God the space he needs to speak with us. God speaks to us through the psalmist. Be still and know that I am God. And Benedict encourages us to stop, be still, and listen with the ear of the heart. In his prologue to The Rule, Benedict stresses the importance of listening. This is followed almost immediately in uh, the short chapters, in chapter 6, with a note on the importance of 
silence. Here Benedict quotes the psalmist, I will guard my ways that I may not sin with my tongue. I have set a guard to my mouth. I was mute and was humbled and kept silence even from good things. I find this a challenge, partly because we live in such a noisy world with voices clamouring for our attention all the time, and partly because of my own compulsion to talk more than to listen. But silence is that second thread that I wish to pull out of the tapestry. Because Benedict, our teacher in his school of prayer, encourages us to find an inner silence, an inner quiet, a calm space to be still and become aware of God's presence. The more we can practice this, the more aware of God's presence we can become, the more clearly we can hear his voice. I repeat that verse again. Be still and know that I am God. John Main, a 20th century Benedictine monk, rediscovered the importance of meditative, contemplative prayer as a source of renewal, not only in monastic communities, not only in the life of the church, but in our individual lives for anyone and everyone who is seeking greater peace, depth, stability to their life. His life and teaching gave birth to the World Community for Christian Meditation, whose work continues to influence and change many people's lives. Meditation as an antidote to our normally frenetic daily lives and in lockdown as a practice able to build resilience and inner calm has been taken up by many, many people. A rediscovery then of an ancient practice. Christian meditation aims at a stillness of spirit through a stillness of body and mind, something anyone of any age or ability can practice. There are techniques taught within the monastic tradition and outside of it for meditation. One such technique would be to find an undisturbed place, set aside 10 to 20 minutes, sit comfortably upright, eyes closed, breathing slowly, relaxed but alert. Then silently from within begin to repeat a single word or phrase over and over, slowly, softly, gently, giving your brain something to focus on whilst you sink to a deeper level within. John Main recommends the Aramaic phrase, Maranatha, split like that into four syllables, Maranatha. It means, come Lord. But any devotional word or phrase would do, the important thing is faithfulness to the practice. Benedict and John Main teach us the value of faithfulness to a simple daily practice of stilling ourselves, of listening in the silence for that still, small voice. Attende Domine et miserere, quia peccavimus tibi. Aterex tume, omnium redemptor, oculos nostros subevamus frentes. In the early chapters of the rule, Benedict stresses the importance of listening and silence if we are to become more aware of God's presence. In chapter 58, he asks only one question of those wishing to join the monastery. Do you seek God? This is the 
third thread that I wish to pull out of the tapestry that is Benedict's rule. It may seem a strange question to ask of somebody knocking on a monastery door wishing to join a religious community, but Benedict is very wise in seeing that people may have very different reasons for pursuing the religious life. The rule can help us here too, in that it makes us ask ourselves the same question, do I seek God? Perhaps Lent is a good time to ask ourselves, what do we seek in life? Happiness, personal achievement, security, a loving relationship, material gain. These things are the daily pursuit of most of us most of the time. We devote a lot of thought and energy to them. Seeking after God is a wholly different kind of pursuit, quite difficult, and a spiritual journey pilgrimage, a pilgrimage of prayer. Benedict understands the practice of daily prayer as a faithful seeking after the God who made us for himself. Within the prayer, made in the silence of our hearts, there lies an invitation to lose ourselves in the presence of God. Saint John tells us that God is love, not just loving, but pure love. To seek God, to journey in prayer to God and into God, to lose oneself in the presence of God, is to seek, to enter into and to be lost in love. Saint Augustine tells us, that it is not by intellect, but by love alone, that God can be known. To seek God in prayer is then an act of love. It follows that as we allow the love of God to touch our hearts and lives in the deepest place of our being, this helps us become more loving. Through his rule, Benedict teaches us that by seeking God in prayer, we are helped in our relationships with others and with ourselves. This is a message for today, that right relationships, loving relationships with others, with ourselves, with creation and with God, will help us through the difficult times we all find ourselves in and will continue to face. As we are beginning to see, the rule of St. Benedict, written over 1500 years ago, still has relevance today as a practical and spiritual guide for modern life. So far I have pulled out three threads from the tapestry of the rule, listening, silence and seeking God. Here I pull out the fourth thread, rhythm. In chapter 43 of the rule, Benedict writes, let nothing come before the work of God. The obvious question this raises is, what is the work of God? For some in our churches, this would appear to mean the ongoing task of keeping historic buildings in good order, or busily organising the next round of fundraising and social events, or engaging fully in all that's involved in the practical arrangements for Sunday services, that is, whilst we are having them. Whilst all these activities 
are important and good in themselves, they are not seen by Benedict as the work of God. According to his rule, the primary work of God is prayer, and especially the prayerful use of Holy Scripture. Benedict encouraged his monks to pray at set times through the day, and the Western Church inherited this pattern in the form of morning and evening prayer, the offices. Central to this rhythm is the reciting of the Psalms. Benedict's monks would say all 150 Psalms during the course of a week. There is real wisdom here. Repetition of anything over a period of time goes deep within us and remains. Just think of how we were taught the times tables or French verb tenses in school. Hymns, the Psalms, other parts of scripture or devotional writings, if returned to often enough, become part of us. They help shape our spirituality, our prayer life. And there is that practice known as Lectio Divina, the repetition of a phrase or a verse of scripture until it is deeply embedded within us. It is unlikely that many of us would meet regularly with others to say the Psalms and pray, but adopting a pattern, a daily rhythm, a prayer routine for ourselves has much to commend it. I know so many wonderful Christians for whom the secret of their transparently rich lives is no secret at all. It is their time spent with God morning and evening. The Celtic Christians of old would have their rising prayers before the day began and their prayers at day's end. A whole raft of daily prayer guides is available through bookshops and online which can help us adopt a prayer routine. And This year many parishes are following Live Lent, a small daily devotional. Benedict writes, no duty should be put before this, stressing how important it is for us to cultivate our spiritual life before our material life. This is real learning. Think of the story of Mary and Martha. Yes, the household chores needed doing, but Mary had put time aside to be in Jesus' company, something which Martha had neglected to do, and it was Mary who was commended for doing so. Benedict recognises and teaches that fidelity, faithfulness to the daily practice of prayer and the cultivation and nurture of the inner life is real work and is the yeast that will permeate every other part of our lives. The fifth and final thread I want to pull out of the rule of Benedict and offer to you is learning. The importance of cultivating a teachable spirit, of being receptive to instruction. In chapter 73, Benedict says he has written a little rule, something practical that all novices, all learners can pick up and use. Here, Benedict's compassion and wisdom really come out. He sees that none of us really loses our L plates. Our whole lives should be a journey of discovery, the greatest, most exciting part of which is discovering who we are and whose we are. When Jesus spoke about becoming like children, in order to enter the kingdom of God. He wasn't saying, be childish, but be childlike, open 
to new possibilities, new discoveries, never thinking we know all that there is to know. Father Kelly, founder of another religious order, the Society of the Sacred Mission, wrote, The moment you think you know everything is the time you know nothing. Benedict sees us all as God's children, all beginners, all learners, and there is so much to discover, a vast ocean to explore. Benedict concludes his prologue by saying he wants to establish a school for the service of the Lord, for those who want to enrich their own lives by being a blessing to others. As we have seen through taking a look at the rule, this means being constantly open to God, to what God might be saying to us at any given time, to what he might be teaching us. Clearly God is still using Benedict and his rule to teach modern men and women and young people how we might come to know God for ourselves in ever deeper and richer ways. One thing Benedict's rule continues to teach me is the truth behind the saying, we are not human beings having a spiritual experience, but spiritual beings having a human experience. I wonder what, if anything, that might mean to you. Here is Benedict again. Whoever you are, therefore, who are hastening to the heavenly homeland, fulfil with the help of Christ this minimum rule which we have written for beginners. I find great encouragement in these words from a great spiritual father who lovingly realises we are always and ever beginners, learners, when it comes to living a spiritual life, to knowing God as fully as God knows us. This podcast was recorded as an offering during Lent, an attempt to pull out from the rule of St. Benedict threads that might be picked up and woven into a kind of prayer rope, something of ancient wisdom that might help us navigate our fragmentary modern lives and give them a new rhythm and depth. Benedict says, the life of a monk ought to be a continuous Lent. Well, for us, lockdown might already feel like that, and I am certainly not advocating that we all become monks and nuns. However, those five threads I have pulled out in this podcast, listening, silence, seeking, rhythm, learning, when threaded together, may well provide something of a renewal in our prayer life. I do hope so. At the beginning of this new year, our Archbishops Justin and Stephen, in a series of conversations, offered a vision for the 21st century Church of England. The three key words they pick out are simpler, humbler, bolder. If there were ever a time when the rule of St. Benedict might help shape the life of our national church and our own lives, it is now. I'm going to conclude with the special prayer for Benedict of Nursia, father of Western monasticism. This is his collect. Eternal God, who made Benedict a wise master in the school of your service 
and a guide to many called into community to follow the rule of Christ. Grant that we may put your love before all else and seek with joy the way of your commandments. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.